Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we have a really, really exciting topic. And I want to immediately introduce Hope Simon, um, who is our ASL interpreter. And if you're not seeing Hope, that means you need to change your screen to gallery view. So as we say, what happens on screen can really play out in the real world. And to really dive into that deeper, um, we're going to introduce Gina Davis, and then we will have a research presentation followed by a panelist, an esteemed group of panelists. So without further ado, I am going to welcome Gina Davis, Academy Award winning actor, founder and chair of the Gina Davis Institute. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I want to thank our members and our partners and, of course, our esteemed panelists for taking the time to be with us today. We are so honored to have partnered with Movio, the world's most comprehensive source of moviegoer data, to pose the question, does on-screen representation impact audience composition? So in just a few minutes, we will uncover the answer to this question when we hear from William Palmer, the founder and CEO of Movio, and also Dr. Caroline Hellman, our VP of Research and Insights, who will present the findings of our latest report titled, I Want to See Me, Why Diverse On-Screen Representations Drive Cinema Audiences. And in addition to the research, we brought together an amazing panel to discuss the importance of representation on screen and how that impacts their work. And again, I just want to thank Movio for partnering with us and for being at the forefront of systemic change. And thank you to all of our members who are here with us today. Our work can only continue with your support and like-minded individuals like yourself. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gina. Thank you so much. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce a Will Palmer, who is the co-founder and he is the CEO of Movio, and he can tell you everything and anything you want to know about your moviegoers on any day of the week. So take it away, Will. Thanks, Madeline. Um, I'll just pin myself and put my um, video on again. Um, so Movio works with cinemas, film distributors, and studios to help the theatrical movie business understand who is watching their movies. Um, was, sorry, I'm just trying to flip through these slides. It's not working. There we are. Um, our purpose is to connect all moviegoers to their ideal movie. Uh, we aim to achieve this by understanding the demographic profile of the audience for every film, including age, gender, and ethnicity. To date, Movio has profiled the box office transactions of more than 45 million active moviegoers. Uh, these are moviegoers that have visited a movie theater at least once in the past 12 months and is collected through our partnerships with participating cinema exhibitors across 58 countries. Now, over the past uh, nine years, um, we've analyzed 1.5 billion box office admissions which has allowed Movio to build the world's most comprehensive audience profiles for more than 5,000 movie titles. Now this places Movio in a unique position to address the specific questions about the diversity of the movie going audience. Uh, through Movio research, um, hang on, let's put my video on. Sorry team. Through Movio research, our dedicated data science division, um, we've analyzed the relationship between the past movie going audiences and built algorithms using, uh, used to predict the audience for future films. Uh, this in turn has led us to publishing a number of white papers addressing the issue of diversity in theatre and on screen, including uh, our most recent white, uh, sorry, our first white paper titled What Women Want from October 2015, addressing how Hollywood accommodates the female audience. Uh, this led to some interesting insights. 60% of the loyalty uh, card holders are female, meaning that the most frequent and loyal moviegoers uh, are female-led. 57% of the audience for animated films are female, suggesting that children are being introduced to theatres by women. But perhaps the most fascinating insight was that whilst the average male-dominated film attracted 209 million at the box office versus only 106 million for a female-dominated film, 
production budgets were so vastly different that the gross box office to production budget ratio was 5.1 for the female dominated film versus just 2.3 for the male, suggesting that an increase in the volume of female dominated films could lead to a far more profitable industry. In our second uh, paper, Breaking the Blockbuster Code, uh, we looked at the changes in the demographic profile of the audience over the days and weeks the films played in theatres. This too was eye-opening, as it addressed the, the long-held view that male moviegoers aged 15 to 30 are the key to a box office success. We discovered that whilst young males certainly over-indexed on opening weekend, as the days went by and the proportion of, fe uh, the proportion of female moviegoers increased significantly, to reach near parity by the end of a film's run. Now this insight implied that the female audience contributed a similar amount of box office revenue than, and that if the targeted marketing had been more balanced, films may actually perform better at the box office. Now more recently, uh, the movie research team addressed diversity head on with the October 2019 paper titled, The Diversity Demand, which explored the correlation between on-screen representation of minority, minority groups and the theatrical attendance of the corresponding group. This paper's insights included the audience for Coco, for example, benefiting for, by having 75% more Latinx moviegoers than a comparable title such as Incredibles 2. Crazy Ritz Asians attracted 186% more Asian moviegoers and What Men Want attracted 296% more black moviegoers or that our first black superhero movie, Black Panther, played by the late Chadwick Bosman, attracted 38% more black moviegoers than Avengers Infinity War, going on to gross 1.29 billion at the global box office. Now this benefited from attracting the core Marvel audience whilst introducing a new incremental black audience to the Marvel universe. Similarly, Captain America led by Brie Larson, attracted 17% more females than the Avengers fin Infinity War, going on to gross also a large number of 1.13 billion. Based on this evidence, it would appear that Marvel's improved focus on on-screen diversity has yielded tremendous results for the studio. Many of the highlights that we've shared with you may seem intuitive. However, we believe they underline an incredible opportunity for the theatrical movie business to address gender and ethnic diversity to ensure that the movie business remains relevant by attracting a more diverse audience. To take this research even further, Movio has collaborated with the Gina Davis Institute, the world leader in on-screen data, to produce the latest research paper titled, I Want to See Me. We hope this chat opens up, a, um, opens up the diversity conversation and becomes a catalyst for change. Thank you, I'll pass you back to Madeline. Thank you, Will. And so, um, Moving along, uh, for the other part of our deck, I'm going to welcome Dr. Caroline Heldman, who is the Vice President of Research and Insight for the Institute, but she is also a professor at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Her research does specialize in the presidency and systems of power, along with race, class, gender, disability, age, and body size. She's authored six books. She's also a commentator for CNN International and Spectrum Run, and she never sleeps. So without further ado, take it away, Dr. Caroline. Thank you, Madeline, uh, and thank you, Will, for this fantastic collaboration. Um, this is the most comprehensive assessment of uh, on-screen representations and audience goers, right? So we put together two years of data on family films, and this is the CJ, right, the top 100 family films. Um, we combine that with audience data, folks who actually went to see those films to answer some very specific questions. So just to reiterate, the on-screen data is provided by the Institute and the audience demographic data is provided by Movio. Um, so the first um, big question is, uh, does the presence of certain groups in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, and age 
um, draw the same numbers or higher numbers uh, of the corresponding audience. And secondly, what are the betrayals? Uh, what is the quality of the representation? And then the third question is somewhat related to that, but focuses specifically on what child viewers are seeing. So jumping into our first question, um, this is again looking at, so if you think about representation in two dimensions, one is um, how often a group is showing up, and the second is the quality of representation. So this really focuses on that first question. Does the presence of certain groups on screen draw larger numbers in the audience? And the answer is yes. Um, so what we find is that there is a correlation between representations on the screen and their share of the total audience, right? Um, and this is especially true uh, when it comes to Black audience members. So if you look at these charts, um, movies featuring a very uh, specific racial groups will actually draw more from that particular audience. Um, and we find something very similar uh, when it comes to gender. Uh, the, the story is that the more male characters in a particular film, um, the more the audience members will be male, the same with women, so the same with female characters, the higher the percentage of female characters, the higher the percentage of women in the audience. Um, and this varies pretty significantly by genre, and I will encourage you to go in um, once the report is live and go around and play with these fantastic infographics that Movio has put together. Um, for example, action movies are predominantly male, right? So uh, many of them are 60% uh, or more male characters, and we see this a similar pattern with the audience, right? 60% or more um, male audience goers. So again, we see race and gender differences, which indicates that people, uh, when they see themselves in the trailer, when they see themselves in the marketing materials for a film, uh, that increases their likelihood of going and actually seeing that film because they know that they're going to be represented. Um, the second big question, um, does the presence of certain groups on screen draw larger uh, numbers in the um, audience? Um, we look specifically in terms of some negative traits. So um, we looked at criminal activity, promiscuous behavior, sex for trade, sexual objectification, both verbal and visual. Uh, we also looked at whether or not the characters uh, were portrayed as stupid or lazy. And um, while it's difficult to kind of unpack an impact here because uh, folks may not necessarily know how their specific group is going to be represented uh, prior to purchasing a movie ticket, um, we can certainly measure indirect effects in terms of word of mouth, right? So for example, if there are negative representations of a certain racial group, folks who see that film might pass that along to others, but we actually don't, we don't find a direct uh, relationship there. What we do find though um, is that um, the ability for Latinx, um, Black people, and uh, Asian moviegoers to see themselves on screen is less than white moviegoers, right? Um, and when they show up, if you look at these lines, uh, the representations um, are the, the opportunity to see themselves as depicted not negatively is less. And so let me unpack that for a moment. So if you're looking at these charts, um, you can see an orange line and you can see a blue line. The blue line uh, is negative representations. The orange line is non-negative representations of the group in that particular movie. And so you can see again uh, that characters of uh, audience members of color have fewer opportunities to see characters of color on the screen and fewer opportunities to see them depicted as not negatively. And I think this is uh, really interesting when you look specifically um, at black representation. So the more, uh, the greater the percentage of characters, uh, the more negative the representation of black characters. So something that um, is excellent to have data on, but requires some action. Um, looking now at what kids are seeing, and this is based on the child viewers, based on um, movie tickets uh, that are purchased um, with that age group. We see that, uh, thankfully, what we found in our research is confirmed here, uh, that children are seeing really good representations, a balance of representations when it comes to male and female leads. Um, but when you look at race and unpack that specifically, uh, we find that while white 
Uh, while children viewers or child viewers are seeing plenty of white characters, uh, they're seeing a reasonable amount of black characters represented on the screen. Um, Asian and Latinx characters are mostly missing in children's content. Um, so there is definitely a demand for audience members to see themselves better represented on screen. And so it's incumbent upon um, the content creators to write and cast more diverse content. Um, it also makes money, right, as all of this research is indicating um, that if you can provide greater diversity and we know that people like to see themselves on the screen, uh, that intuitively or logically leads to um, more money, uh, money that is essentially being left on the table now by content creators. Um, and we also want to really focus on the fact that um, the impact is greatest on youngest the youngest consumers. And so we need to diversify um, the portrayals of historically underrepresented groups, especially uh, with films that are being seen and content that is being seen by young viewers. Um, and with that, I will pass the baton back to Madeline Denono. Thank you so much, um, Caroline. So Will said, audience evolution is the rule and not the exception, and that there truly is a business imperative and that female-led films um, can make a lot more money, you know, at the box office and particularly diverse, um, diverse films. And uh, Caroline said, you know, clearly diverse characters on screen brings diverse audiences. But you know, what does the census say? Well, I think if we think about being relevant and vigilant to our population, you know, by 2045, people of color will be the majority and there will be a white you know, minority. So I'm really thrilled today to have three exceptional panelists who I'm gonna ask them to uh, pop on their screens. Uh, first, we have Rosalind Chow who is the, um, an actor. She stars currently in Mulan. She also is in Netflix's Laundromat and uh, Joy Luck Club. So welcome, Rosalind. And then we have uh, Diane Paragas, who is the director, writer, producer of The Yellow Rose, which was just picked up um, by Sony Pictures for distribution. And last but not least, is Jayun Choi Munford, who is the Senior Vice President of Production for Universal Pictures. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, Rosalind, I'm gonna start with you, but I think, um, am I right that you may have a birthday happening this week sometime? Oh, no. Yeah, so happy- um, More birthdays. Yeah, happy early birthday to you, but, um, for those of you who may not know everything um, about Rosalind, other than her being Mulan's mommy currently, um, what was it like being five years old and in the um, California-based Pinking Opera? Um, and how did that lead to this illustrious uh, career that you have? I don't know about illustrious, but um, I, yeah, my parents um, love Peking Opera and I think I was even younger than five when I first was on stage. So it was sort of second nature. And it was, um, it felt more their culture than mine, to be honest. And they were trying to immerse me in their culture. Um, but uh, I firmly wanted to be American. And, you know, I wanted to be, oh, I don't know who, one of the girls who was on the monkeys, you know? <laughs> I did not want to be Asian growing up, but um, they were really trying to immerse me. And I think that was part of it, was that I didn't see people, I didn't see myself reflected on screen. So I was in denial of who, where I came from. And then, um, so you started out as a child actor and then, you know, straight through, I think you landed a major role at 16, you know, in, in, in MASH, MASH, is that correct? Last, and yep. And um, yeah, that was, you know, back then really most of the roles were written for Asians. And um, so it always involved an accent and, um, but it was a wonderful first, you know, big job because everyone involved was very classy and very, um, uh, you know, they were mentors to be honest. Um, so it was a wonderful experience. I was very lucky. 
And so last night, you know, on the Emmys, um, America Ferrara was talking about, you know, being Latina, but being an American and California born. And she said, um, one of her first auditions, you know, she read for it and they're like, well, can you be a more, be more Latin, you know, Latin? And she's like, I am Latin. What do you mean? And then, you know, she realized that I want, they wanted her to be, you know, a stereotype. And I just wanted to know, did you find that also, you know, happening to you? Always. always. I mean, I, honestly, um, it, it, I, a big thing was that I maybe didn't look Asian enough, whatever their idea was of Asian enough was. And, you know, I didn't have an accent in real life. And I didn't um, seem, for lack of a better word, you know, I didn't seem like um, the the babysitter in the courtship of Eddie's father. You know, I didn't seem, uh, I didn't defer enough. And I remember one director actually said to me, you need to be more deferential. Um, so I think as a result, I was the opposite. Exactly. So thank you for that. So Diane, I'm going to jump over to you because, um, you know, you, you're a Texas, Texas gal. And, um, you know, you talked a lot about um, really not seeing um, the stories you wanted to tell represented, certainly, you know, not in Texas. And I also know that, um, you know, immigration is a really important um, you know, area for you. So can you talk a little bit about being a Filipino American and growing up in Texas and uh, how that informed or led or challenged you to uh, write stories of, of your own? Well, I mean, growing up in Texas, I grew up in a small town called Lubbock, Texas, which is in the panhandle. And definitely I was one of the only Filipinos, one of the only Asians in my whole school. So I definitely did not see any representation of myself. And like Rosalind, I wanted to be the blonde cheerleader and hated, you know, being Asian. And and there's a scene, uh, it's even in our trailer for Yellow Rose where, where Rose is like making her eyes big in the mirror. And I think, there's my daughter. And- um, Okay, that's my daughter. Sure. <laughs> COVID. Um, so- us. <laughs> no, she's got a weird outfit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay okay so um so uh, sorry about that okay, okay. Not at all maybe go to uh Jayun for a second i'll come right back. okay okay great so Jayun, um i mean you went from uh graduating from mit to then pursuing your mfa at ucla um what was that evolution for you and what was it or when was it that you decided that you wanted to get into entertainment? You know, my parents always want to know that answer too. Um, <laughs> I, you know, it's one of those things where I grew up just always loving stories. I was, I was kind of a bookworm. Um, I, I it sort of, now you're getting the familiar refrain from all of us, I think of we grew up feeling kind of invisible, wanting to be seen, wanting to be reflected in, in the stories that we're reading, that we're seeing, and especially as a bookworm, that was hard. And it was easier in books because you can disappear into that as opposed to when you're watching yourself um, on a TV screen or in a movie. And, but it was always just something I loved. You know, I, I, I loved being able to escape. I loved being able to imagine myself in a different world and, and um, being somebody else for not necessarily because of my own identity, just because it's fun. And I think everyone can experience that. Um, and I just kind of did the thing that I think some people do, but specifically for myself, it was, I went to a good college. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with myself in terms of my career. I knew nobody in the entertainment industry. My parents are first generation immigrants. Um, and I, I just, I had no concept of what any of that was in terms of having a career, especially if I wasn't going to be an actor, I wasn't going to be a writer, I wasn't a director, like what did that actually mean? Um, and uh, long story short, I, I was doing research actually. Um, and that was my, that was my job after I graduated, but I was 
incredibly miserable and I wanted to feel fulfilled in something that I felt passionate towards. Um, and so I ended up going back to grad school for, for film. My parents were surprisingly for me, not because they were overly strict or anything, but I genuinely thought they were going to completely freak out and they didn't because they just, wanted me to find something that I loved and wanted to pursue. They still liked the idea that I was going to grad school because um, as good Asian parents, they liked that I had a master's degree. Um, so I did that and then I just, I started working. But so the, so I would say that there was a, there was a, it was always there as something that I loved and I wanted to take part in. I just didn't know how. Um, and, and I do think that not seeing people that look like myself on screen made me think that there was no real path for it. Um, but I just, I, I started to just kind of educate myself. I had a friend who started screenwriting and he ended up telling me about these graduate school programs. And that's how I, I found my way through and producing, especially for me, felt like a really um, tangible kind of path to being part of the process to be both creative, but also to be able to take this sort of business minded side of myself and meld those two together. Um, so that's how I ended up here. And thank goodness I, I didn't have to <laughs> find something else to do after I went to grad school for it. So what was there a beloved uh, female character or from a book that you were in love with as, as a child? Was there anything that you read that was your, your you know, dog-eared pages of I, so many of them. I, I would I would look to Anna Green Gables as like my, you know, one of my favorite books as a as a kid. I still go back and reread it. Um, and but it is funny. It's really funny to me being here and and seeing like all of these amazing panelists. But especially growing up, the two reference points I had for movies is seeing somebody that looked like myself were either the animated Mulan movie or Joy Luck Club. So thank you for that one. But I, and those are, but they're they're meaningful. And my point is that it was it was something that I was able to I was able to find myself in and and escape into because I saw somebody that looked myself like myself in a different way. Um, but definitely in books, it was everyone from Anna Green Gables to Pride and Prejudice, um, and you know silly things like, I guess, more youthful things like Babysitter's Club and Nancy Drew, like all of those are such great, strong, independent characters who are all female. Um, and they're multidimensional and complex and they experience human emotions. And that's, that's what I gravitated towards. Thank you. And so building on what um, Jay Yoon said about multidimensional and very, you know, robust and, um, multi-layered uh, stories. I'm going to go back to you, um, Diane, to tell us a little bit about uh, life as a Filipina American living in Lubbock, Texas, and how that led you to wanting to tell uh, stories that you weren't seeing. Yeah, so um, I, I also want to you know, shout out to Rosalind because, you know, Mulan and Joy Luck Club are, were two of the only references in, in um, and Leia Salonga was my kind of hero who is in my film, um, but she was the only Filipino that anybody knew of that was in any kind of media. And when it came time for me to make my own movie, I really wanted her to be in it and, um, and she was. But um, I think there's a couple of things uh, for me that was interesting about growing up. Um, I didn't have any role models as, a, as female directors. So it wasn't a path I even thought of choosing when I was in college. And that actually delayed my journey into becoming a filmmaker because I didn't see anybody doing, uh, being a film director, even though I was naturally inclined towards, I made little films when I was younger. I just didn't think you could do it for a living. Um, and the two scripts I wrote very early in my career were Yellow Rose and another script, which I'm, I'm coming back to now, both featured Filipino leads. And in my journey of trying to have these films made, uh, you know, it's, it, it took me over 15 years to get Yellow Rose Finance because people just kept telling me there isn't a market for a female protagonist who's Filipino, whose parents are undocumented, who is marginalized. And, you know, and that was the nose I kept getting, not for any even beginning to look at whether the, the story was worthy or not. It just 
there was no market for it. Um, and things I think changed for me with Crazy Rich Asians in that we got financing after that movie. And I think Hollywood saw that there was a potential for that. So the, the study that was revealed today is so, um, while you know it seems obvious, it's real data that shows not just that people want to see themselves, but people want to see the other outside of themselves as well. Um, and that's, I think that's almost as important. And so, so my story, you know, someone said that the more specific, I think it was Bong Joon-ho, the more specific you are, the more universal your stories are. And, uh, and I think for my film about a, a Filipino girl who longs to be a country singer, um, I think everyone will, will see a little bit of themselves in that character. Uh, and at the same time, introduce a new kind of heroine that's somebody that we haven't seen before. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. So, um, so Rosalind, I'm going to go back to you. So here we have both Diane and Jayoon talking about the impact that seeing you in Joy Luck Club um, had. And so can you talk a little bit about your career um, and your experience um, in the industry and also, you know, the impact um, of, of Joy Luck Club, which I remember, you know, in our movie, This Changes Everything, our documentary, uh, Sandra O oh was talking about, it just blew her mind the first time she saw Joy Luck Club. And especially for her, it really resonated with the relationship between her and her mother, which she had never seen anything like that in a movie. Um, so if you can talk a little bit about that, and then we'd love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, Milan, you know, talking about, you know, source material that goes back to, you know, 1500. Um, and what's, what that has been for you and, and, and personally, and then also what you have seen in terms of the impact um, on audiences around, actually around the world. Okay, that's a long question. So you, uh, steer me if I ramble. My kids say I ramble, so steer me back on if I... Um, so the first question was um, about growing up and not seeing myself reflected. Is that right? No, and also, um, as an actor, um, you know, being in Joy Luck Club, and that was such an iconic film, and what was the impact of it on you being part of that film? And then also... Oh, what was the experience that you probably garnered from, from audiences, consumers, um, seeing you, you know, in that film? And, and how did that impact your career or choices that you made uh, moving forward? So first of all, you know, when I first got into acting, you know, there was the thought, would well, you know the saying, if you see it, you can dream it. And I didn't see it. So, uh, but I still tried to dream it and I wasn't sure if it was ever possible for me to star in a movie. I, you know, to me that seemed so far out of reach. Um, so when, um, I think I'd done a movie just before that called Thousand Pieces of Gold and that was about the first Chinese um, American pioneer woman. And um, from that, that led to Joy Luck Club. But I was, um, when I read the book, I was pregnant and um, with my first child. And I remember thinking I'd never seen, I'd never read about somebody who was having a similar mother daughter experience. Maybe Woman Warrior was another book that came the closest to my experience growing up. Um, then when I read Joy Luck Club, it just, it blew my mind. But of course, when Wayne came calling, I was pregnant and that's all I could think about at the time. I really was not, um, uh, I didn't make it easy for him, <laughs> let's put it that way. <laughs> but um, once, you know, once we were on the set and working with all other Asian American women of all ages and, and um, you know, at the time, I don't think I realized um, how, what a pivotal experience it was going to be. But once it was released initially, here's the interesting thing is that Asian Americans, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to put a blanket over all of us, but 
back then, back in the old days, because there was so little product, I think we were hypercritical of product that did come out. And so as a result, I feel like we were our own worst enemy. So we would be at panels where, you know, the audience would be effusive for the most part, but usually the heavy criticism did come from fellow Asian Americans. And I understand that because there's, when there's one cracker, you want that cracker to be just perfect and delicious. And so there were issues that Asian Americans had with it. And we didn't have um, the community support that we had behind Crazy Rich Asians. So it didn't quite blow up the way everybody thought. And I still remember we had been asked to present together at the Oscars. And then they canceled us at the last minute because they said they had another Asian. And so we were canceled. And I still remember all three of us were on the phone. We were on a pay phone for some reason. I think we're at Sundance or someplace. And I turned to them and said, oh, they, they just canceled us. And everybody was shocked. We couldn't wrap our brain around it that you could only have one Asian on stage at the time. That to, to us seemed crazy. So we did not understand the nature of the business, even being in the business at that time. Um, then later on, as time went on, I did notice, I mean, people of all races, all colors come up to me, Italian ladies, black women come up to me and say, oh my goodness, your mother was my mother. So there is that experience that all of us who were the other, I think, can understand from Joy Luck Club and, and the whole idea of a strong woman. And I had a babysitter who was um, Mormon at the, at, well, she's still Mormon, but <laughs> at the time she was Mormon. And um, she was having um, uh, some, you know, marital issues and went to a therapist and the therapist recommended that she watched um, uh, the storyline that I was in, in uh, Joy Luck Club. Wow. So that's when I realized the reach was a little further than we thought. And to this day, it's still, as soon as somebody says that they love the movie, I, I don't automatically think, oh, you must have a Chinese mother. I automatically think, oh, you must love your mom. I mean, you must have a very close relationship or not. <laughs> and then how did that experience inform you in terms of material and choices that you made? And then um, uh, you know, with Mulan um, being out, um, you know, such an iconic uh, a story, what has been um, that experience for you um, working on it and um, any impact or that you've received, you know, from audiences? Yeah, that's a um, really good question because, um, you know, career-wise after that, um, you know, I, I had it, like I said, I had a new baby and I was a latchkey kid growing up personally. So I wanted a totally different life for my kids. So I was in and out of the business. You know, it would just depend on what their schedules were. You guys are all nodding. I'm sure you, you feel the same way. So it's, it is, you know, it's a push pull. Um, but when Mulan came around, I had, I was about, um, I was about to start doing a play in London and um, I got the call from Mulan um, before leaving for the play and I had actually said, um, I'm going to be gone for six months so I don't think that's, you know, a possibility and the casting director said, let's just go for it anyway, try for it and then this movie keeps getting pushed so let's go for it and honestly, um, I got the call um, in December when I was in London and I at first I was hesitant because I, you know it is a story that um, is so much a part of my childhood and I also wasn't sure um, if you know I wasn't sure what the details were uh, you know I was just there I was going to be away for a long time but once, you know, I dove in, I realized the importance of doing this story because, you know, Mulan the animation is fantastic. And, you know, it was the first time a lot of us 
saw a, a role model that we could aspire to and our kids could aspire to, but it was still an animation. And I think it's so important for us to see ourselves reflected as, you know, human beings um, on the screen. Um, in the end, you know, Mulan is, I, I have heard, you know, critiques that she's sort of a superhero, which is not true to the real story. But at the same time, you know, they need to get, you know, bring in the audience as well. And that is part of that package. You still see her, um, her dilemma as a woman. And I think, you know, that it's just seeing yourself reflected on screen is huge. Whether she has an accent, I mean, if she was, a, you know, couldn't speak, it, it doesn't matter. Just having a visual of yourself on screen, I think is, it's everything to young kids. I mean, I can remember having a hard time for finding um, a movie for my son to see where he wasn't going to be embarrassed mm -hmm. of being um, a half Asian male. I wanted him to be as proud of his Asian-ness as he was of his European roots. And it was hard. And I finally took him to see Rush Hour, I remember, and God bless Jackie Chan and you know, all that's fantastic. But I, I remember saying to him when we left, see, there's, you know, um, uh, Kung Fu stars who are Asian American as well. And he's like, he's not American. <laughs> and uh, I was like, yeah, but I know, but he's Asian. He's like, he doesn't speak English like I do. He's not me. And I remember thinking, wow, he was really little and he still wanted to see himself reflected. So um, the fact that they don't, you know, that she does have an accent, it's fine because it's part of the culture. Um, but, you know, kids want it, they crave it. They, they're craving to see themselves on screen. So I'm really happy that I did this. And I'm also happy that, you know, it was a push pull as far as the mom's role and how strong she was. And, you know, in the end, you're, you're the actor. So you, you're not in the editing room or any of that, but I did try and make her as much as is possible. I did try and not have her be, you know, the shrinking violet mom. Exactly. And the tiger mom either. I didn't want either one. No, <laughs> but I no mean, balance. yeah, no, for me, I mean, um, your character came across as, of course, wanting the best for her daughter, um, but also um, being fully developed in terms of the relationship between Mulan and her mother, and also the relationship between the parents. Um, and she definitely stood out as her own person um, in the family unit, you know, as, you know, the matriarch. So I think that really um, comes Good. across like really well. And uh, Jay, you know, I'm going to go over to you because, you know, you have the golden ticket. I mean, you're in a power position and, you know, now you've been able to take, you know, all of your experience um, and you're making decisions, you know, at Universal. And so, I'd love to, for you to talk about, you know, based on your experience um, growing up and your work experience, how that's informing choices that you're making at Universal. Um, and also, um, we're super excited about 355. So, fangirl, um, anything that you can uh, share with us about that, I'd love for you to talk about that. Um, yeah, I, I think... Everything that I said before absolutely is relevant to how I approach, you know, the projects that we take on, the projects that I personally take on. Um, and I'm fortunate to be at a studio that believes in that as well. Um, it's, it's a place that we're all invested in trying to find diverse stories. And I think, as everyone has said, it matters because, like all of us, our audiences are made up of very diverse groups and they all want to see someone that looks like themselves on screen. They all want to see their different experiences and their different point of views being, being reflected in a way where they feel like they're being seen and heard. Um, and I mean, even just from a business perspective, as, as Caroline said, it's good business. It's great box office success. Um, we've seen it ourselves at the studio. It is, We've had incredible success with um, 
one of the longest running franchises in the business, which is Fast and Furious. And it also happens to be incredibly diverse. It is, and it's always been incredibly diverse from day one. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think that that's a coincidence. I don't think it's a coincidence that you see the diversity on screen, that you see the diversity in the audience, that you have the box office success that you have. And the studio, our studio has also had success with movies like Get Out and Straight Outta Compton. So you can see right there that there's a really meaningful lesson to take away from it. Um, <coughs> sorry, something in my throat. Um, but, but because of that, it's, it's, a, it's something that matters to all of us at the studio. It matters to me when I'm looking at new projects. But most importantly, the reason that we're able to make it matter is because it's a studio agenda. It's, 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 it comes from the top down. You know, it comes from Donna Langley. It comes from our leadership team. Um, everybody is invested in this. It matters to us creatively to find stories that reflect the diversity of our audiences as well. And um, connected to that is our, the building of our creative partner relationships that we've had um, for the last, I mean, for a very long time, but especially over the last few years, but we've had, you know, everyone from Jordan Peele to Will Packer to Janelle Monet to Elizabeth Banks to Lord Miller and Justin Lin, just to name a few, um, we have countless more. And, and for them, they also are filmmakers and producers who champion original and inclusive storytelling. And it matters to them that they're able to tell the stories that they wanna tell. And so for us at the studio, our job is really just to provide them that safety and the support and the freedom to do that. Um, so as we're building all of this into, into our work, you know, I think, I think as much as it's, it's difficult for, for any of us to find great original movies, that's, that's been the bread and butter and the core of the universal film business. Um, and and I, I always kind of go back to, there's this old quote from Mark Twain, the Moon Butcher, which is basically that there are no new stories and they're all just, old ideas that are sort of put through this mental kaleidoscope. So, so when we're talking about diversity, when we're talking about different perspectives and casting, I think that's really just finding great stories through the lens of a different, original, new, unique perspective. Um, and no matter, but at, no matter what, all of that is to say, great storytelling is all about human connection, right? It's about characters and emotion and all of us can feel the same feelings no matter what we look like, no matter who we are, no matter what our identity is. And so just, you know, going back to the idea that we're just looking for great stories, that's why it matters because we have to keep looking forward and we have to keep building on, on the thousands and thousands of stories that have already been told. So let's find new ways to tell them. Um, so, it's, so it's definitely something that we are looking at every single day when we're working on our stuff, when we're assessing new material as well. Um, and that includes 355. And I think I, to that point, like 355 is really just a great, it's just a great action thriller spy movie, you know, and it happens to star a group of badass women. That's it. <laughs> they just, it's Jessica Chastain, um, Lupita Nyong'o, um, Penelope Cruz, Diane Kruger, and you just get to see them kind of swagger around and be total bosses on screen. And I feel like I don't really need to say much more about it because <laughs> who wouldn't want to see that? I think that just gets you going. Um, but it is a genre that's kind of a well-worn genre. And now we get to see it through, through a different character lens and that's it. Um, we happen to have a great group of actresses a great director in Simon Kimberg. Um, so we're all really excited about it. We're excited. I'm about glad you are too. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I wanted, you know, people um, who are members who are um, emerging, you know, storytellers um, may not be as familiar, but uh, when you talked about looking for, you know, new stories and how do you incubate and cultivate new stories, you know, Universal does have a very successful um, writers and directors, you know, program. And so yeah. I'm just curious if, um, if that is an outlet also for you to kind of cultivate um, and um, how is that program, do you see those people starting to 
trickle into the universal um, ecosystem. And if you could just, for anyone who may want to apply, if you could yeah. just talk just a little bit um, about that. And then part two is um, uh, I do um, want to give uh, uh, credit to Universal, who was the first, you know, the, one of the first studios to raise their hand when we announced our spell check for bias research tool. Um, so we can talk about that after, but I think learning about the, the program would be great for our audience. Um, yes, I would love to give a special shout out to our program. Um, actually to our, it's, it's the Global Talent Diversity and Inclusion Group, um, which is just called GTEI to be for short, which is what we, we call them internally. Um, so the writers program was started in 2017 by the GTDI group. Um, so several years ago, Donna and the team decided to focus on um, building a department within Universal that would really be about diversity and inclusion for feature films. And in, as, as it got built up, it was actually the first dedicated operation of its kind at, its studio, at a studio. And it had basically in a few short years, an amazing group of programs and initiatives that have been built up by, by the team over there. Um, so they have everything from the writers program, which is an inclusive writers program. There's a composers initiative, which is brand new and the first of its kind. Um, there's an animation writers program, which is also the first of its kind and um, a director's initiative as well, amongst other things. So the way the writers program works is that there are like, I don't even know how many applicants, I think it's over a thousand um, that apply and they go through a rigorous process. Um, and then once the applicants are selected down to a handful of, of um, writers for this program, what happens is that they're paired up both with executives who are in our film group and also with uh, producer mentors to, to work with these writers on two original ideas of theirs um, to develop with the studio. And it's a great opportunity for writers both to get, to get that studio development experience, which they might not have gotten otherwise, other than going through the normal process of trying to get representation and doing, you know, going through that, those means, which aren't always the most easily accessible, um, particularly to underrepresented and marginalized um, communities. And so it's a great opportunity for the writers. And it's also a great opportunity as, as the executives to get to work with these writers who, like I said, they may not have the traditional means of access. Um, and it, it exposes us to them as well. And um, the really great thing on top of that is that we've had a lot of amazing success stories. I think across all of those different initiatives I mentioned, there have been, um, I think there have been a, about 100 alumni for just from the last few years. And there's about a 40% success rate in terms of those alumni getting produced credits. Um, so that's, and I think about half of those 40% actually have landed within the NBC Universal larger family, which is, which is awesome. It's, um, for example, my actual, the writer that I worked with this year, which is really, really exciting. Um, she's this great young writer and she ended up just being staffed on a show that's, um, that's coming out from the UCP group and Hulu. Um, so it was really thrilled for her. Um, but we've had also two writers from our program who continued to work, the program from last year, who are continuing to work on scripts that they were developing with executives. Um, and I'm excited to see where that goes. So we're definitely seeing across the board, either they start working in TV, they go through, um, they get their independent films made, um, they just become working writers in the industry at large. Um, or they continue with us. So all of those things we deem as great success stories. And I think, I think help to give more leverage for, for young emerging writers to come up through the system, through these sort of untraditional means. Um, and it's, it's a great program. So for anyone that hasn't heard of it and wants to apply, they definitely should. Um, there is a website dedicated to it. Thank you so much. And, you know, in terms of success stories, you know, Diane, um, you are a major, you know, success story and you have come up through 
you know, various programs. Uh, you participated with us at, you know, Bentonville. And, um, you know, if you can just talk a little bit from kind of best practices, because it did take 15 years, you know, for Yellow Rose, you know, it is very successful. It is the first film that was picked up by, you know, Sony for, you know, theatrical distribution, whatever that can happen. Um, you know, it's, there's so many first evers um, that you're having, um, but, and now you're building on it. And I do want you to talk about Three Lives of, of David Wong, um, which to me is very unique the way you're approaching it. But if you can impart your, you know, Diane goodness of wisdom um, to anyone, you know, what you've learned through that process, getting to where you are with Yellow Rose. And it's one thing to say, okay, great. I finally got my first film made, but now I need, you know, and you've done more than one film, but I need to get all of my films made um, and your thoughts on that. And then I do want you, just because the whole, you know, immigration is so extremely timely and relevant um, to what's happening. It's just, if you can also talk about that, um, that project. So multi-layered question there. Um, I just want to start out um, and do a shameless plug. We are actually going to be in theaters uh, hundreds of theaters and hundreds of cities uh, on October 9th. So we will be in theaters that are open. So, uh, you know, please support our film. We are also, um, I think the last gold open film of the year. Uh, I hope it's not the last because I hope other things get scheduled as the months go by. But for now, we are the last uh, gold open. So as um, you know, if you don't know what that is, that that's a, that's an initiative that um, you can go to goldopen.com that uh, if you're Asian or Asian American or people that want to see diversity, you can support by, um, you know, buying tickets for the film or buying out theaters with your friends so that you can support movies like this one um, and, and ensure good box office, which is, is the way Hollywood measures these things. So my shameless plug is out there, yellowrosefilm.com, hashtag yellowrosefilm. October 9th uh, in a theater near you and in Canada. And I think I can say now we're also releasing an original motion picture soundtrack, which I'm very excited about because uh, it is a music film and uh, it's something I'm super proud of. And Eva Noblezada, who's a two time Tony uh, nominee is an extraordinary singer and the music uh, by Dale Watson. I also wrote some music is something I, we, we hope you guys will listen to. So shameless plug, but you know, I think, you know, one step towards diversity opens the door for others. And I think that's important. Um, now I forgot the questions. Oh, no, so, <laughs> no, but based on the fact that, you know, you, you, you've been doing this for a long time, you chose the path of, mm. um, you know, writer, you know, director, mm -hmm. um, Wuya, you know, Yellow Rose, um, well deservedly mm -hmm. will have this major theatrical release, but it's about getting the third, the second, the third, the fourth. Yes, the film. right. And then also, yes. why you're choosing, interesting enough, uh, the David Wong story and the unique approach to it. It's documentary. It's not narrative. And then just any, you know, tips that you want to impart to other filmmakers who are out there, um, whether it's trying to raise capital or just trying to get their second or third film. So, okay. Um, I have a couple of things. I hope we have a little bit of time, but um, we do. We first do. of all, getting your film made. I, part of the reason it took so many years is I kept going to, you know, predominantly white male Hollywood for permission to make this film. And I kept going back to whether it was agents or production companies or whatnot. Um, and when I, I, I started to reach out to my Filipino community, um, to Filipinos from the Philippines, from the largest television and film network in the Philippines had this competition. Um, they wanted to put a Filipino film on the world stage and, and I won that competition and that they were our primary financiers for our feature. Um, and then I started going to other equity investors who were Asian and Filipino. And all those years of me trying to convince people that the story was worthy, it didn't take any convincing. They knew the story was worthy when I went to my own group. So that's, that's an advice that I give to you because as each of us, like Jayun and Rosalyn, all of us are, are in positions to help others. And I think we can, you know, um, we can 
we can help each other in that way. And someone actually had asked a question in the Q&A. Another thing that's important is to hire other people, uh, other Asian Americans, other women. Um, when you get to that position, make sure that you make other opportunities for other people. Um, so uh, after Yellow Rose, I was very fortunate. I, I, I did get signed uh, I'm at UTA and I'm also managed by LBI. And what I told them is whatever projects I get next, I will in make sure in, in my power, I would put an Asian person in the lead, increase the roles of women as much as I can. And I've already started to do that. I, I am working on two fairly larger budget projects of which I'm changing characters into women, adding Asian <laughs> characters that weren't there before, doing, you know, I'm trying to do my best. And as far as original content, you mentioned one film, The Three Lives of David Wong, which I'm being supported by Creative Capital and Sundance. Um, it's a experimental film about David Wong, who is a, a Chinese immigrant who was wrongfully accused of murder. And I'm telling that film all through uh, live action puppetry. So it's a, it's a very- yeah, why did you Very, like uh, live puppetry? Like, aside from the you know esteemed, um, you know Henson Jim Henson Entertainment, um, why why did you choose puppetry? Are you trying to? Is it for children or it's just? No, it's absolutely not. It's not. Um, it's more uh, attuned to a film that not a lot of people saw called Anna Lisa, which was by Charlie Kaufman. Um, but the, the idea was that I, I was sort of told this story through the attorney who wrote a, a manuscript who was responsible for this man's exoneration. And he told it to me in this oral history kind of way. And as I was hearing more about the story, I realized that this man uh, was accused of murder because he was thought of as a non-person. He's a Chinese restaurant worker, the guy that delivers your food. He's a faceless, nameless, statusless guy. And the prison system pinned this murder on him. And so my idea was to tell the story as an oral history and make this person a puppet, a sort of non-human figure. Um, and also when I did the, the proof of concept it was quite beautiful too and very interesting. And uh, it was something where I wanted to sort of push genre. Um, so we're, we're sort of waiting to get into production for that. But the next project, which is a very ambitious project that I'm writing now is a pop music opera set in World War II about a Filipino woman who becomes a guerrilla soldier and has a magical world of lizards. Um, uh, and it's a war movie, Jay and I'm pitching you. Uh, <laughs> it's a war movie told from a female Asian perspective uh, about the Philippines, which lost uh, over 600,000 people, including my grandfather who fought in the war. Um, and it's a side of the war we haven't seen certainly not from a female perspective, certainly not in a musical format, and certainly not as a pop opera, which I'm writing the music for as well. So I think like you take this opportunity and you think big, but you always keep, you know, the things that are important to you in, in, in the work that you, you sort of lay out for yourself. I will always be interested in this relationship between the East and the West. It's always going to be in my work. Um, and I'm always going to be interested in, in, in movies about the other. And uh, even though one of the films I'm doing is a romance, like a notebook, and another one that I'm attached is a, a sort of heist movie, there's still, I'm still gonna make sure it's about women and diversity and you know, that, that, my, that voice and that through line is in everything that I do. Well, you heard it here, folks. Hopefully a few years from now, we may see uh, all of these three women coming together to work on um, a project. I know that we are out of time. So I just want to thank uh, so much. First of all, Will Palmer um, and Movio for their support. Um, and uh, we hope this will be a long time um, partnership. So thank you so much, Will. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. Uh, thank you so much you know, to Rosalind, Diane, and Jae Yoon. And for those of you who did post questions, we will get answers for you and send them back to you um, via email. Um, so, and, and uh, Diane, one person did ask, what was the name of the website you were talking about to support either Asian Americans, or you mentioned, some, they, they didn't hear that. Um, it's Gold Open. And just so you know, Mulan was also a Gold Open film and uh, so was Crazy Rich Asians. So um, it's, it's an important issue. Rosalind, you can talk a bit about it. 
Right. If, um, let's just put it this way. If Gold Open had been around during Joy Luck Club, it would have been a very different uh, result. Joy, uh, Gold Open has made a huge difference for um, films that are specifically targeted towards Asian American audiences, which then helps us to intersperse, you know, um, other films as well. Thank you. Um, any other final words, Jay Yoon, or we will uh, answer everyone's questions? Um, well, I actually realized I didn't talk about Cell Check for Bias ah. too much if we wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I didn't actually mean to ignore that. Um, I, I just wanted to say that it, it has been, um, it's been amazing to see all of that come together. And obviously our partnership with the Institute has been incredibly invaluable. And um, I think, you know, the, the work that, that Gina and your team, including you have done is, has been incredible at, at raising the awareness and heightening it um, for all of us, both at Universal and I think at the, at the industry, for the industry at large. Um, and so, it's funny because I, I was thinking about the fact that like I do come from this more science driven background um, and research driven background originally and now I'm in this very creative field and I think filmmaking is usually thought of as this sort of unquantifiable art right like you have it's, it's just like magic and um, but there's a bit of art and science to to it it's 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 a balance of it and I think that um, Cell Check for Bias is just an incredible tool in the science, in the science side of it, you know, it, it, it's giving us another tool and another weapon to be able to say, um, to point out all of the different opportunities that we might be missing um, in terms of getting more representation on screen. So I don't, you know, I'm not personally working um, super closely with it in terms of, in terms of the day to day with the pilot program, but I know that all of us are excited about it and it's, it, it is going to be meaningful for us as we're as we're constantly trying to, to stay ahead of things and, and be conscious of the choices that we make. Thank you. And then I also want to give a shout out um, to the Walt Disney Company, who is also a partner of ours on Spell Check for Bias. And for any of you who want to know more, you can reach out to us or also um, you know, shoot us an email. So with, without further ado, we're going to let everyone get back um, to their day. We want to say thank you so much. I know we will have another event coming um, mid to late October, which will be announced you know, shortly. Um, and October 9th, everybody, we have to go see you know, Yellow Rose. Uh, and if you haven't seen Mulan on Disney Plus, please do, it's fabulous. And uh, Jayoon, we look forward to seeing 355. And just thank you thank again, you. everybody. Thank you for your support. Stay, um, stay healthy. You too. Thank, thank you, you too. Thanks, Anna. Bye.